Well, good afternoon. I'm Ken Biberai, and welcome to Coffee with Ken, a thought leadership series at the nexus of business and politics. In the news today, the global population has reached 8 billion people, and Amazon just announced plans to lay off 10,000 employees. Today's topic is innovation in American defense, and we're joined by Trey Stevens, the co-founder, executive chairman of Anduril. Great to see you, Trey. Hey, thanks for having me, Ken. Most important thing, do you have coffee? I mean, are you ready for this conversation? Let's just... You know what? I'm going to make my own pour over while we talk. I, I take coffee very seriously. I don't want to do the comedians in cars getting coffee thing where they're drinking bad diner coffee. This is setting a new standard that the, the executive chairman of Andrew is making the coffee while we're doing coffee with Ken. So we're honored. We're excited to have you on. Um, and I'm sure you can multitask. So you can make a coffee and, the, you know, we'll oh, yeah. it off. I'm good. You know? Why does the United States need to reboot the arsenal of de of uh, democracy? You know, there's a, a nice little softball about, you know, our entire <laughs> national security apparatus while you make your espresso. Yeah, the, the biggest possible question uh, to, to kick things off. Um, you know, I, th I think the, the situation in Ukraine is making it even more clear that um, there's a lot of really good arguments for soft power. There's a lot of good uh, arguments for diplomacy, um, but there's also still a clear argument for hard power serving as a deterrent um, to conflict, um, especially uh, with the rise of great powers um, like or near peer competitors to the United States. And, you know, during the Cold War, we had kind of all we have figured out that we had total dominance over core techno technologies like aircraft carriers. Uh, next generation fighter aircraft, things like that. Um, and when McNamara took took over, he basically said, you know, we're going to figure out ways that we can do cost cutting um, to get ourselves back to the point where we can produce in quantities, um, but at lower costs. Um, and that worked pretty well uh, for getting us through the end of the Cold War. Um, but really in the last 30 years, that, that situation has changed dramatically. We no longer have the insurmountable technology advantage that we used to have. Um, and the technologies that are going to be critical to deterring conflict in the future are, are capabilities like applied artificial intelligence, computer vision, um, mission autonomy, next generation command and control. Most of these are applications and technologies that are um, the, the, the tech behind them is more present in the private sector than it is in the public sector. And it's with commercial technology companies that are optimizing ads, not in concrete basements uh, in the D.C. metro area. So that's really what we're trying to do at Anduril. We're trying to figure out ways that we can bring the right talent back to, to working on the strategic problems of the future that will create that deterrent power. So, so lay off the scope a little bit, right? So what I've been fascinated by is how far we kind of have fallen behind and how little innovation is actually happening at the highest levels of national security, right? I mean, I think I read something you guys posted and, you know, our nuclear, you know, codes are still held on floppy disks, right? I mean, Tesla technology is more advanced than most of the military machinery we have. What, what is the state of software and our own kind of defense capabilities today? And are we falling behind China and others around the world? Yeah, it's not great. I mean, I think there are some areas where we still have a lead. There are other areas where that lead is being challenged. Um, software is, is not the realm of the traditional defense primes. Um, and I think that this is something that, you know, without critiquing the, you know, effort that they're putting into it or the patriotism of the people that are working at the primes, which is without doubt, uh, it's just that the, the businesses aren't well optimized to recruit and retain the people that they need to build these critical systems. Um, and, you know, when you can go as a software engineer, you know, graduating from a top tier university, you can go and make half a million plus dollars working for Google or Facebook or Snapchat or whatever, like you're, you're probably going to do that, um, particularly given that the culture is well aligned to reward engineers and to celebrate their achievements and accomplishments, uh, whereas the, the traditional defense industry is really not. It's not optimized um, for, for that sort of talent recruiting. Um, and, and I think this is where the, the problem really becomes the most pronounced, where we just, uh, we're not, the system as, as it exists today is not set up well um, mm -hmm. for us to advance and win in those categories. And you personally have a little bit of experience on both sides of this, right? I mean, you spent some time in national security and intelligence overseas, and obviously at Palantir and Founders Fund. Talk, talk a little bit about what was the aha moment for you when you actually thought like, you know, this could be something that you want to push forward, that you could create and roll with Palmer, that this was something that you were going to spend real time and effort and, and energy on? 
Yeah, you know when I, I went to Georgetown right down the street from from you, uh, Ken, at American, and I think I had this belief that the the intelligence community was going to be something like James Bond. That yeah. like I was going to show up on my first day of work, and they were going to hand me the keys to an Aston Martin, and I would have access to the most incredible supercomputers that have ever existed. Uh, and you know, I sat down behind a CRT monitor and Windows ninety eight, and uh, uh, you know, I would do what I call coffee break searches, uh, where I would, you know, run a search and then go get coffee and then come back and hope the search was done. Um, but then I would go home and I would break out my, you know, IBM ThinkPad laptop uh, and I would run Google searches. And, you know, it, it was the disparity was incredible. Um, and it kind of occurred to me um, in, I guess, 2007, um, when I first saw a demo of Palantir, um, that something wasn't really matching up. Like the technology is the tools that I was using internally to work on a really, really important mission uh, were pretty different than the tools and technology that were available in the private sector uh, that I didn't have access to for some reason. Um, and so that was that was really like the turning point for me. Um, when I joined Palantir in 2008, uh, you know, it was kind of mind blowing uh, the level of horsepower uh, <laughs> that the organization had. Um, and I really haven't looked back since. I think there's there's just a tremendous opportunity to get our best and our brightest in these critical areas refocused on doing things that have meaningful strategic importance to the nation. Yeah. And, and, and drill down a little bit. I mean, because you're really at the heart of this focused on software, on really enhancing innovation and technology within the defense ecosystem, right? I mean, as you mentioned, some of the primes are making the big aircraft carriers, the submarines, but you're doing a lot of that hardware too, but really the brain power is, is behind the scenes, right? And the AI and the innovation and so on. Talk a little bit more about, you know, your mission and Android, where you're, what lane you're trying to own vis-a-vis yep. -vis primes and others out there. Yeah, everything we build is, is like really latching onto the concept behind mission autonomy. We are right. building things that are intended to be low cost, they're intended to be attributable and they're intended to be autonomous. And there, there are you know, plenty of really, really smart metal bending engineers all mm -hmm. over the world that are building things like you know, submarines and aircraft carriers and fighter planes. And um, you, can, you can do that with enough aerospace background or enough shipbuilding background. Um, what we're saying is not that. We're not coming in and saying like, we're gonna build the next aircraft carrier. We're saying, um, you know, we need to create asymmetric advantages. And those asymmetric advantages aren't necessarily these incredibly expensive, exquisite, bespoke systems. Um, it's leveraging commercial technology to build things that are very low cost um, and then use the software to you know, pile drive in behind it um, to make these capabilities incredibly high end, incredibly uh, functional and useful to the warfighter um, without it becoming a bloated defense program that we've become so familiar with in the, in the government space. And, and so much of an ancillary benefit, I would imagine, is just the human capital and potential being able to repurpose elsewhere and focus an attention on, on other mission critical aspects of broader national security priorities, right? I mean, if you can yeah. create something that's mission autonomous, right, then you have five less eyes focus on that and then they can focus on other things, right? I mean, how much of that is part of the value prop that you're uniquely kind of, you know, pitching? Yeah, but there's a bunch of ancillary benefits. It's like, you know, it's re cost reducing, which is huge. Um, you know, I would I believe that it's possible for the U.S. Defense Department to cut their budget by hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we only do that if there are new entrants to the space that are introducing new technologies that, um, you know, save that where they're making tens of billions of dollars in the process. And so I think there's a real business case there. Um, the second thing is it does take the warfighter out of harm's way, which is incredibly important, obviously. Um, the future of conflict is not throwing millions of bodies into battlefields against each other. It's leveraging these asymmetric autonomy, uh, autonomous capabilities to um, dominate a battle space and create a deterrent impact to prevent conflict. And, and I think that's uh, that's an important part of what it is that we're doing. Uh, the other aspect of this that I think is really important on the autonomy front um, is humans are really good at a certain set of things, like really, really good. Like we are good at decision making. We're good at, you know, ethical frameworks. We're good at um, making really tough calls um, on a moment's notice. Uh, computers are really good at other sets of things. They're good at never falling asleep and not making mistakes uh, th that are simple. Um, and I think what we can do is we can empower the warfighter 
with capabilities that do what the computers re- do really well to free up, as you said, the humans to have yeah. cycles left to do the things that we're really good at. So take us behind the, the veil a little bit about the defense procurement process, right? Like you mentioned McNamara and so on. So from some of the history that I learned just researching Andrew and, and how things work, it seemed like the DOD was, was kind of tied to Silicon Valley at the beginning in the 30s, 40s, as we're talking about World War II. And then there was a moment in time in the you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, that were, you know, kind of a consolidation of procurement and how contracts were given out. And then you fast forward to kind of the last 30 years, some of these contracts have one bidder, you know, applying on them. And then you have the big primes. So it seems like higher barrier to entry and access, a disconnect between the innovation and software of Silicon Valley and so much of what's being created in this country. How does procurement work, right? Like, how was it five years ago? And how are you disrupting it? Maybe, maybe that's a better kind of, you know, target. Yeah, I think five years is probably too short of a window. <laughs> Not much has changed in the last five years, but um, yeah, I mean, if you go back to like I forgot the we lost three years because of COVID, so yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, only two years. Um, the uh, if you go back to like McNamara era during the Cold War, um, the the realization was we were spending a bunch of money on these bespoke platforms. Uh, we had like multiple generations of aircraft, multiple generations of sh- ships that were all kind of running at the same time. Um, and there was this realization that the spending was going to get out of control, that we already had technical dominance, we should focus on production, we should pro- uh, focus on uh, cost reduction, um, and that kind of carried us out through the end of the Cold War. Um, and then in 1993, um, Secretary William Perry um, called together a group of the industry leaders in the defense sector in what colloquially became known as the Last Supper, and he said, <laughs> Uh, consolidate or die. Um, we, the the party is over. Um, we're going to get much more lean, much more efficient. Um, and thousands of defense contractors narrowed down to like the 10 that we know today through, through massive consolidation over time. And this is leading to what you just mentioned, Ken, which is like, you know, there's one or two, maybe two bidders on most of these platforms. Um, you know, there's these defense specific companies that own a significant proportion of defense spending um, and the the also rands in the innovation ecosystem have a very hard time breaking in. Um, I mean, there, it's like not it's public knowledge that both Palantir and SpaceX had to sue the government to win contracts um, because the oligopolies that exist in this space made it impossible for them to break in without doing that. Um, and so I, I think we're in this really unique area uh, of or this really really new unique era where the Defense Department is saying the right words about the importance of innovation. There's a lot of theater going on around the importance of innovation. There are literally hundreds of innovation organizations that exist across the DoD. And yet the procurement system is still built towards highly bespoke cost plus contracts for defense platforms. And those contracts are almost universally given to one of 10 companies that have existed as some consolidated uh, unit since the Cold War. Um, and I think this is going to create massive problems for us because, as I said before, those companies have a really hard time recruiting the people that you need to build some of these advanced systems of the future. Um, and we need to figure out better ways to draw the the right energy, the right money, the right talent around those problems uh, in order to be successful in the future. But what I find interesting about Andrew is a little bit of how you approach this and by putting skin in the game in your own research and development, right? So if I'm not mistaken, you'll go out there and actually manufacture and produce things and then go to government and show it to them and then they can buy it versus winning a contract, slowly researching how to do it, then adding, you know, and then that takes what, five, yeah. years, 10 years, 20, right? So your approach is just fundamentally different, I think, from other primes, right? I mean, how do you approach kind of the value prop and the, the skin in the game that you're already putting in at the beginning versus waiting until you get a big contract, right? Yeah, I mean, the traditional way that this is done is what's called a cost plus contract, where the contractor gets paid to develop a thing, and then they get paid to sell the thing, and then they get paid to sustain the thing. Um, and uh, the the argument behind this is that for dis- defense specific applications, the government has to own the, the cost that's associated with building these things. Uh, and there are contractors that are willing to take that on. Uh, with some kind of fixed margin, usually like between seven and twelve percent, on top of whatever the costs are that they're they're incurring to develop these capabilities, um, and you know I think for some things that's probably still the right way to do it, um, but for a, a large category of capabilities that are largely enabled by commercial technology, 
Um, we should be buying these things as products in the same way that they're bought in the commercial sector. And in doing so, we'll be able to leverage private capital to amortize the cost of that research and development over time. And so if if I, as you know, one of the founders of Anderol, can go out and raise a billion dollars or more than a billion dollars um, to cover the research and development costs for something that I then sell as a completed product to the Defense Department at a better than 12% margin, uh, that, that's good for the taxpayer because they're not owning the cost of that R&D. Now, if you look at the R&D spend, the internal R&D spend of the large defense primes, they, they usually sit somewhere between about one and a half and two and a half percent of annual revenues. Um, so like unbelievable as it is, even five years into Andrew's history, um, we represent about 10 to 20 percent of almost all of the defense primes R&D spend ourselves. Like we are spending... Uh, all, like 20% of what the, the primes are on internal research and development. And, you know, there's the, uh, that one and a half to two and a half percent of, of revenue that, that they're spending. We're spending almost, if not 100% of our uh, revenue on research and development spend. And this is more akin to the way technology companies work. Sure. They have really, really high R&D spend as a percentage of revenue. And that's why we get the, the speed of iteration that we get in the private sector that we don't see in the public sector. So talk a little bit about the investment required, the risk that you're taking, others are taking, right? So if you're thinking about traditional stuff, right, you have VCs, then you have private equity, and then you have public markets and so on. And now you have the element of the government investing, and maybe you have DARPA type entities, et cetera. How is risk allocated? And then how and when are certain buckets of dollars needed, right? Like, so you're in the VC stage, right? So talk a little bit about that and, and the risk involved to you. I mean, right, if you're building all this stuff and spending all this on R&D and the government's not a buyer for it, what kind of exposure or challenges does that pose to you? Yeah, I mean, I don't actually think the different asset classes and, you know, public matter. private matter or private to public matter that much to the way that you think about risk. Um, even in the public markets, you are rewarded for taking risks and being right. Uh, you're punished for taking risks and being wrong, obviously. Um, but for us, it's just a matter of staging that in a responsible way. And so for us, we don't start a program and say, like, we're going to put $100 million toward this thing over the next five years. And, you know, hell or high water, we're going to burn down that entire $100 million. That's not how we do things. We go into it and we say, what is the, the minimum amount that we can invest in this to get it to a, like a minimally viable demo that we can go and show the government and say, look, we've got it to here. We will take it to the next step if you say that you are a buyer, if we do that. Um, and if they say, you know, yes, we're signaling this is a mission set that we're looking to solve, um, we would be a willing buyer if you built the thing, then we'll go and spend more money to get it to the, the point that it's production ready or near production ready. Um, and we just want partnership with the government in that process. We don't, we don't want them to fund all of our research and development. We just want signaling that they're, they're a willing buyer if we were to do the thing that we set out to do. And so in doing it that way, we can always pull the ripcord. If we have trouble getting it to a demo, pull the ripcord. If we get it to a demo, we show it to the government and they say, we are not a buyer of this technology, we can pull the ripcord. We don't have to spend all the way down. Gone. And talk a little bit about some of the products and some of the success to date, right? Customs, border security, some of the towers you've created, drones, obviously, almost now synonymous with Android. What, what have you had success with? What's in the pipeline? Where are you headed in the kind of next 12 to 24 months? Yeah, I mean, again, the, the core for us is mission autonomy. So mm -hmm. we're building autonomous systems. The starting point for that was our counter intrusion capability, which is you can kind of think of it as like a 30 foot tower with a series of sensors on top of the tower um, that will send notifications to the users in the field, the security officers in the field that tell them when things are happening in their area of responsibility. So it will say, there's a person, here is what they're doing in your area of responsibility. Here's an aircraft, here's what it's doing in your area of responsibility. Here's a vehicle, here's what it's doing. Um, and you allow the human to make the decision with what they're going to do with that information. Um, this is used on military bases, uh, it's used in critical infrastructure, it's also used as you suggested with Customs and Border Protection for the national borders, um, both the North and the South. And uh, that program was kind of like a kickstart in a lot of ways for the capabilities that we we're going to be developing because it's kind of like, a good first step to a much more complicated problem as those towers uh, start moving. And what I mean by that is you put a tower, uh, all the capabilities on a drone. Now you have, you know, 
two degrees of motion. You have things that are moving in your area of responsibility. You also have the thing that's surveilling it uh, is also moving. Um, and so we did that. Uh, the first step was with a small drone that's called Ghost. Um, we're building other drones that are kind of operating in that same realm. Mm -hmm. Now, the next th thing that we did is instead of taking a tower and looking down at the ground, um, we thought, what would happen if you took a tower and you looked up into the sky? And uh, doing so, you built a counter drone system where you can identify, detect, and track aerial threats. Um, and then you can mitigate those threats with a series of countermeasures. And those countermeasures could be as simple as like radio interference or GPS denial or other forms of electronic warfare. It could also include things like interception. Um, so one of our uh, products, uh, most popular products in the pipeline or in our, in our portfolio is what we call Anvil. Uh, which is a very high speed drone that will take off and follow the track that's passed to it by the tower. It will acquire terminal guidance and fly at very high speeds into the adversary drone to take it out um, and, and bring it down. Um, we have other kind of technologies that we're develop developing in both of those spaces, both in like uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance on the more intrusion side of things, as well as in the counter air side of things. Uh, and then we're also working in the command and control space. Uh, many of your listeners have probably heard of the joint all domain command and control system. Uh, we are spending a lot of time with that effort, um, helping the DOD think through how you manage the complexity of a more crowded command and control environment as you introduce low cost attributable autonomous systems to the equation. And there's a bunch of other stuff too, but I, I don't want to take up all the time. No, no, no. Amazing. And, and look, we started and most of this conversation has been about the United States and about American uh, focus on national security, but you obviously are focused on allies all around the world, right? I mean, you're doing things in the UK, in Australia, as well as the Ukraine. Maybe talk a little bit about that. Like, how do you see our partners around the world and the role you play to be a resource to them and bring that innovation uh, elsewhere? Yeah, I, I mean, it's no secret uh, that we have, it's really important that we are in, so, that we act in support of our partners and allies around the world. Um, I think one of the like great misunderstandings, especially in the tech community, is that as a defense company, like we can just sell to whoever we want. It's like we can build a capability to sell to China or sell to Iran. It's like, no, guys, it's not, not how this works. Uh, the U.S. government has a, uh, a very clear legal process for determining where you can and can't export defense articles. This is something that we've been involved in since the very early, earliest days um, to make sure that we're getting our technology in the hands of people around the world that uh, that need it and that uh, we have close agreements and relationships with in the United States. Um, that's something that we will continue to do moving forward as well. And talk a little bit about some of the resistance, right? You are clearly a disruptor. Um, I think it was the acquisitions chief of the Pentagon, Bill LaPlante, recently said something like the tech bros aren't helping too much in the Ukraine, right? I mean, do you feel this resistance? Is it at the Pentagon? Is it with primes? Is it through procurement? You know, you're obviously disrupting a sector that there's lots of uh, value and legacy relationships and dollars and revenue. I mean, talk a little bit about that. Like, where are you feeling pressure? Is it, you know, are they welcoming? Or are they not? How, how is this all playing out for you? Yeah. Um, wow. So it, I, guess, I, guess it, I guess it depends on what he means by tech bros, right? Um, if he's talking about like Google or Amazon, yeah, he's probably right. The, the tech bros and the the fang companies are not really doing that much uh, yeah. but you know this is one of the beauties of democracy um you know there's no civil military fusion google yeah. doesn't have to be as helpful to the department of defense if they don't want to um obviously the, uh, many of your listeners are probably familiar with the activists inside of google pushing them out of project maven a few years back um i think google is like more open and interested in in helping in some strategic ways now than they were then um, but, uh, you know, it's a democracy. You don't have to do it. You can, believe it or not, have an American company that doesn't work with the Department of Defense. And I, I think that that is a good thing for uh, for our republic. Um, now, on the, uh, on the like, what about the tech bros uh, that are trying to help the Department yeah. of Defense and, uh, and, you know, have had a mixed kind of gradation of success? Um, I think it's problem. It's sort of problematic because, or Bill Plant's argument is sort sort of problematic in that the capabilities that the Ukraine needed to defend themselves, um, they needed like years ago. <laughs> they didn't need uh, in May. Uh, they needed it like in 2020 and 2021 when they started identifying that this was going to be an emerging problem for them, um, and. Because the defense department, our defense department, didn't lean into that innovation ecosystem to 
uh, mm. build production capacity and get those technologies up to speed so that they could export them if needed to our allies and partners. Uh, they got into the situation where they were sending decades old technology to Ukraine that had been largely sitting in warehouses. And so, you know, cer certainly some of it can be blamed on the tech ecosystem not being like forward leaning enough when it comes to defense. But I think the Defense Department also has some share in the blame uh, in that they weren't ready for this. And as a result, they're sending over technology that's uh, not new. And in fact, it's uh, not even used oftentimes in our arsenal. Um, and it was just things that we had to get to them as quickly as possible that we had on hand. Interesting. So with the remaining time, I mean, you as a executive chairman building this company, um, I mentioned at the top of the talk, Amazon laying people off, the tech sector, the economy looking challenging. Yet I believe you're hiring like crazy and growing and raising. Talk a little bit about what it's like to kind of plan for this growth. How do you think about, you know, your expansion, where you want to be, how you find this talent, and also a little bit about how you're motivating engineers to come to a company that happens to be focused in the defense space. I mean, that probably isn't a natural for a lot of these engineers. They haven't been running to the Pentagon or to primes in the past, but you seem to be able to attract them. And then how are you bringing in veterans and, and getting this kind of ecosystem where you're getting people in the field? as well as the best and brightest as it relates to kind of the innovation sector and engineers, right? I think that's what your secret sauce is kind yeah. of really uh, shaping up to be. Yeah, look, the reality is defense, really all of government, uh, government like technology problems are recession proof or largely recession proof. Uh, so when the rest of the tech community is getting hammered by uh, reductions in consumer spending and the fintech community is being hit by um, increasing interest rates. And, you know, you can kind of go into like a long yeah. litany of things that are affecting the tech community. Um, if you're selling into the DOD, the defense budgets continue to go up. Uh, mm -hmm. The problem space around Ukraine and Russia, Iran is becoming more and more clear uh, every day that goes by. And so we don't have the same kind of macro pressures uh, on our business that a lot of other companies are facing. Um, that said, I, I, you know, my message to the tens of thousands of software engineers who have lost their jobs at the, the big tech companies in the prior weeks is like, um, you know, hang up your, you know, ad optimization skills and come and do something that matters. Come and work for a strategic, strategically important mission. Um, you know, we are hiring and, you know, to call, harken back to the Uncle Sam days of yore, like, you know, we need you yeah. uh, to come and work on something that is going to make a difference to not only our ability in the United States to defend ourselves, but also to the ability of our allies and partners abroad to uh, hold off the threats that are, you know, knocking on their doorstep. Um, yeah. And so I, I think that that is just a really important message. I don't think that, you know, there, there seems to be this narrative, particularly in DC, that the tech community it is like fundamentally morally opposed to working with the defense community. I think that's just like totally false. There's a lot of people that are very open to doing things that matter and that would much rather, if given the option, do something that matters. Um, but there's a very small number of very vocal activists that have a tendency to shout down all of the rational people um, and uh, make it very difficult for these large businesses to operate in the space. Um, mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you know, they, the, those people wouldn't be interested in coming to work for Anderil. You know, we don't have those internal problems around activism. Like when you sign up to work at Anderil, you know what you're signing up to do. Uh, there's no confusion around that. And uh, and I think that's, you know, that's why it's so important that companies like Anderil exist, not just Anderil. I don't think that we have a monopoly on this. I, I want a lot of these new defense tech startups to work. And it seems like more are coming out every single day. Every time you see something, there's, there's new innovation and new companies coming out, mostly in California, but now even here locally in Northern Virginia, D.C. Uh, totally. Trey, thank you for raising the bar on uh, what you guys are doing at Anderil as it relates to national security and defense. Thanks for raising the bar by making your own coffee on Coffee Week 10. I set a new standard everywhere you go. This is, uh, this is where we want to be. But, but appreciate you taking the time. It's, it's great to connect. And it's been amazing to watch your growth and uh, what you guys are working on. Thanks so much, Ken. Excellent. Everybody tuning in, you can visit coffeewithken.com to subscribe, catch up on past sessions, and also tune in on Spotify, iHeartRadio, and Google Play. Trey, talk to you soon, man. Take Thanks, care. everyone.